I want to talk about sexual responsibility and talk to you from the sense that if the Bible continually and repeatedly with, with frequency is addressing something, then there must be an urgency of that word. And so the Bible teaches us and addresses multiple things when it talks about sexuality and God's purpose for sexual, sexual activity in our life and how do we govern that through the lens of the scripture. And so we want to share some of those things with you. And I want you to write this down. The very first thing is that the sexual life of the unmarried person is of great concern to God. Whether you're married or unmarried, God is concerned about sexual your sexuality. And so uh, some people think, well, you know, did God create sex? And if it's to be enjoyed, why is it such a taboo subject? But there are definitions of how God reveals his word to us on what level of life we are in, whether we are single or whether we are married. Now, time's not going to allow us to share everything that we want to share um, because um, of time, but we want to give you some practical things and also some scriptural things that we believe that have helped us and that will help you as well. Number one, we want you to write this down. You belong to God. You belong to God. Now, this is the thing that uh, none of us in this room like to be told what to do. We don't want anybody bossing us. Amen. I mean, look around you at your table. Uh, you know, everybody knows someone who's bossy. <laughs> uh, we don't want to be told what to do. Uh, my cousins used to say to me, I'm the boss of you. And then I would respond, well, I'm the boss of you. And we just go on and on and on bossing each other. We don't like to be bossed. But the Bible says we belong to God. And if we belong to God, then he's our boss. And he has the right to tell us what to do. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who was, lives in you and was given to you by God. Then he says, you don't belong to yourself. Well, that just busts everybody's bubble. It says, bless God, I can do what I want. I am, I'm 21. I can do what I want. Well, in verse 20, he said, for God bought you with a high price. So honor God with what? Your body. So it's important that we glorify God in our body. In Romans 6, the Bible says, don't let sin control any part of your life, not in a sinful desire, uh, uh, any type of uh, uh, activity that would bring uh, sin into your life or allow it to be an instrument of evil in your life. We are dead to sin and we're raised into new life. So we cannot allow sin to control any part of our life. God's word is very clear. He created us. He owns us. He, be, he, he bought us. He indwells with us. So everything that we do should bring glory to God through even through our body. Amen. So you belong to God. Say, I belong to God. The second one is this, God invented sexual desire. It was God that invented that. In Genesis chapter one, he gives us the why. The why is this, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Well, there's the why. Why did God allow and give a sexual desire? It was so that the earth would be filled. Now, I know some families that have taken that scripture and have 10 kids, 12 kids, and they have been fruitful and they have multiplied. But that only comes through the covenant of marriage and the covenant of, of a marriage relationship. And so we have to understand that the sexual desire that God gave us is only to be fulfilled in a covenant of marriage. If we don't fulfill it in the covenant of marriage, then we enter into what is called immorality or fornication. And in general, sexual promiscuity is moving into the realm of fornicating, which the Bible calls a sin, and that is not where we're to live. We're not to enjoy sexual relationship in outside of marriage. Now, the world we live in 
tells us that we can do what we want. In fact, they flash all these images from media and Hollywood and every commercial you see on TV, they're using sex to sell something. And so you can't always avoid it. But fornication should never be named among Christians. Now, there's a scripture in Ephesians 5 and 3 says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. And it's very, very important to understand that. Paul says, because of the temptation to immorality, that every man should have his own wife and every wife should have his own husband, her own husband. <laughs> Go with me to 1 Corinthians 7. Look at what the Bible says in this chapter. Yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much He's talking about 2024, in my opinion. There is so much sexual immorality. Each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. Now, he was saying, this is how one of the ways that you can flee sexual immorality is to get married. Now, I'm not, we're not saying to you today that you have to get married or remarried. That's not what we're saying. But this was Paul's advice, and he was, in, he was giving us instruction. This is how you can flee from immorality. Then in that same chapter, a few verses later in verse 8, this is what he says to the people who aren't married or who are widows. He said, it is better to stay unmarried just as I am. That's what Paul was saying. And he was saying that he had the gift of celibacy. Not everybody's called to that gift, but he did. And he said, if you're unmarried or if you uh, uh, aren't married and you're a widow, it might be better for you to remain unmarried, just as I am, but if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry because it is better to marry than to burn with lust. And the point that I want to take on this is that according to Scripture, all sexual intercourse before marriage is considered immoral. It is considered a sin. No matter if you've been engaged for a long-standing time or you've been with somebody for 10 years, 15 years, if you are having sexual relationship outside of biblical marriage, it's called fornication. It's immorality. Paul said, if you can't exercise self-control, then you should marry. Now, I had someone after the last class just asked us about you know, courtship and dating and all of that. And when is, you know, should we get married fast or should we get wait and have long extended courtship? Well, the Bible says that if you cannot exercise self-control, then maybe you should get married. Now, I'm not saying it. Yeah. We'll be doing uh, marriages at the close. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. We can get your license later. No, no we're not. <laughs> now, God, God created sexual desire, but he also created the place where that was supposed to happen. Yes. And that is in the, the covenant relationship of marriage. So if you attempt to alter that in any way, it's immoral before God. And I want you to write this down. Why did God command that we find gratification for our sexual desires only in marriage? Well, I, in searching the scriptures, to the best of my knowledge, God does not give us a direct answer to that question in his word, and nor is he obligated to. Some things that God leaves that we discover through wisdom and experience of what God is saying to us through the word of God. What is he saying to us through the spirit of God? And so if we disobey what God is saying in the spirit, we will end up discovering that disobedience leads to tragedy. If we walk in obedience, it brings, to, it brings life. Do you remember this verse that says that when, sin is con, uh, when, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin? And then when sin is finished, it brings forth death. And, and that's important because you can discover death or life based on the choices and the decisions that we make. So we don't have time to go into everything, but the third thing that I would say is this, keep yourself free 
from any enslavement. Number one, you belong to God. Number two, God created sexual desire. And thirdly, don't become a slave to anything. Amen? Only use your body to glorify God. Now, here's the verse that we'll throw at you. Romans 6, 16. This is powerful. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. He was saying, don't be a slave to anything. Don't let anything enslave you. And it's hard to avoid seeing temptation because it's everywhere. Every ad on TV, everything that pops up on your phone, it's there. And you have to say, I will not let myself come under this, and I will not allow myself to be enslaved by it. Yes. Now, we're going to share some do's and uh, mostly do's, but we've got a few don'ts in here that we feel like that maybe the Lord has helped us in the last 33 years of marriage, and then we courted and dated for five years before that. So we feel like we have a few things that we want to share with you, maybe cover with you that will help you. And I'm going to ask Pastor Bev to start out with she will on that. Okay. Number one, understand God's design for sexuality. We need to recognize that sex is a sacred gift from God. And it's the world that has given, even the, the word sex, we associate something dirty with it or something nasty or vulgar. That's not God's design. Sex is a sacred gift from God, but it's intended for marriage. So we should embrace God's design and we should honor it in our relationships. Hebrews 13, four says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So number two, set boundaries. We need to establish clear boundaries in dating relationships to safeguard purity and uphold biblical principles. So I want to preface this. We realize that not everyone has set these boundaries in the past. These, these things are not to shame anyone that is not our heart or to cast any, any onlooking eye at somebody. This is just to continue to raise our frequency, as Pastor yes. Susan said, and to continue to go on. But I encourage you, if you've been promiscuous in the past, once we know better, we do better. So we can't use it as a license to sin, to just say, well, what's done has already been done, and this is where I'm at now. No. We are the righteousness of God, of Christ, and we need to strive for that. So heading into this, I do want to say, and I know that we're even an older group, but it still deserves being said. So ladies, let me encourage you here. I've had ladies tell me before, I don't know why I keep attracting these same type of men. Well, I can tell you why because of what they're attracted to is what you're putting out there. So let me encourage you as a mother, okay? As a mother, cover it up. Go ahead. Let me just say it, cover it up. Nobody, well, I said this in the first session and the pastor said, well, some people do that are, have a problem, but yeah. nobody wants to see all that, okay? And if they do, they probably already have a lustful spirit and that's not who you need. But Amen. let me encourage you, ladies. There is something called a cami. <laughs> Some people have never heard of such. So I just want to encourage you, if you do not know what that is, it is an undershirt that you can wear underneath something that will help you. And I, it's, it sounds a little comical, but I'm being serious. Ladies, when that is what we're put, even women of Christ... And every picture that we post, we're exposed. And we may not think anything about it. Maybe we weren't raised. Maybe we were raised where every woman, woman's in our family, their chest was exposed. Well, let me tell you that for people that have, or even if they have been exposed to that, men are visual. And we can't say, well, that's their problem. They have a lustful spirit. That may be true, but we should not cause anyone to stumble. So we need to cover it up. We need to be presenting ourselves well. Men, it goes the same way. I'm happy that you have found your new jive and that you're working out in the gym every day. But I don't need to see pictures daily of your six pack that still looks somewhat like a two liter. <laughs> I don't need to see it every day. 
And then on Sunday, you up leading me in worship. And all I can think about is all the mess that I've just like seen when I didn't want to see it. So let's help one another out. God created us as visual people. He created us as sexual people, but we should not lead anyone else into sin. Now, I am not saying, I've had young ladies tell me before, but Pastor Bev, this is 2024. You know, we're not, I'm not saying that you have to dress like Laura Ingalls. If you don't know who that is, that's a lot. You do not have to have a prairie dress on. You're trying to run and you're tripping. I'm not saying all. All of that. You're rolling down a hill. Have you ever seen that intro? <laughs> I'm not saying that. Sin will trip you up, sisters. Sin will trip you up. No. I'm not saying that. But I am saying you can still be stylish, but here's something that will help you, okay? It's practical, but I'm just going to put it out here. You can be stylish. You can be vogue without going rogue, okay? Here you go, sisters. You can be vogue, but you don't have to go rogue. That goes for the men as well. So we need to do things that will help help a brother and a sister out. Amen. Amen. First Thessal Thess so set boundaries. Yeah. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification which is what I've just been talking about. We don't like to use that word a lot. We like to hear I'm saved, everybody's saved. Yeah, you ask people, you say, I'm saved. Everybody ain't saved, but they think they are. But sanctification, which that means set apart. Set apart. I want to go back to one more thing when I said about you, we don't know why we keep attracting the same type of people. When some, because that's what we're putting out there. If you really, if you have a desire, some of you have no desire to ever be married again. We understand that. But if you have a desire that some point in your life you think, I may be open to that. Do you know what the most attractive, the most attractive thing and that could ever get the right person's attention is the anointing. The anointing. When they walk past you or they see you or they see a picture of you, they should say something is different about that person. Well, perhaps it's because they're focusing on our face and not everything else. They're like, wow, she has a face. So <laughs> sanctification, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the person of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Amen. And I would say to what she, Pastor Bev said, you might be ugly as sin, <laughs> but if you're anointed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. Have you ever, well, don't, don't, don't yell out. But <laughs> if the anointing is attractive, <laughs> amen. Now, when we're talking about setting boundaries, now, if you're in a relationship, with anybody and you're single and I, this go for everybody but you have to set boundaries what are we not going to do yes. what are our do's and don'ts we're not going to do this we're not going to do that and then you hold those boundaries one of the, some of the things that we're going to share with you are very practical we would say this no touching and no petting yes. no touching and no petting. Now, I'm not saying you can't put your arm around somebody, but you know when someone's hand is where it shouldn't be. And you have to be strong enough in your commitment to your boundaries to say, we're not doing that. Now, most men are aggressive, but I promise you that if a godly woman says, we're not doing that, even if they feel like they have had a bucket of cold water poured on their head, they will respect a woman who has set a boundary. And so no touching and no petting because intimate touching is the prelude for sexual intercourse. And so we have to make sure that we only enjoy that in the, in the bonds of holy matrimony in marriage. Some other things that are tips that we've learned along the way is that there's no traveling alone together, staying in hotels. Well, we're gonna go to Las Vegas, but we're gonna sleep in different beds. We don't believe you. No. The Bible says that we're not to let our good be evil spoken of. And that we're to shun the very appearance of evil. And, it's, and you may have had every pure intention, but if you are putting it out there and people know you're traveling together alone and you're in these hotels and your stuff, it, doesn't get, it don't look good. It does not look good. 
And it is an opportunity for the devil yes. to trip you up and cause you to offend the person you're in relationship with and spiral them towards hell. Now, you have to think about that. Now, and, and this is where we have to be careful not spending time in one another's apartment alone. I'm not saying we're not adults because we're 21, but we need accountability in our life and we need people that will help cover us so that we don't sit around and just have idle time because idle time is the devil's playground. And you have to be careful that you're not sitting around just doing, go do something, um, you know, out in public and, you know, do activities together so that sexual temptation cannot have a foothold in your life. It's very, very important. Thirdly, we want you to write this down, guard your heart and your mind. Guard your heart and your mind. And we just kind of briefly touched on this, that media has a lot of influence upon us. Entertainment, music. We have to choose to surround ourselves with positive influences that align with our biblical values. Uh, we went to, um, we have to, we have to guard ourselves and protect ourselves. Let me give you the scripture and I'll give you a few things. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23 said, keep your heart with all diligence, diligence because from it flow the issues of life. So we have to guard our heart and we have to guard our mind and we know that we can't really avoid sexual temptation or any temptation for that matter because it's everywhere you turn. Yeah. Behind every tree and under every rock, the devil's lurching waiting to attack you, waiting to shame you, waiting to embarrass you, waiting to trip you up so that you can't fulfill your destiny. Yes. And so you have to be very careful that you guard your mind. And if you continually dwell on something, um, it's going to produce that in your life. So if you are fantasizing, you can slip into sexual fantasies in your mind from a movie or from an internet uh, uh, or whatever. This is where we have to flee from sexual temptation. If when you open up a movie and in the top it says sexual, new, uh, sexual connotations, <laughs> nudity, and it gives you all these descriptions, well, right there, you should be saying, mm, that's probably not best for me. And not take on the thing, well, I'm mature in the Lord and I can handle it. And I'm so seasoned in Christ. Or I'll fast forward through all the bad parts. And when it gets done, you've seen two minutes of a movie. Yeah. What happened? Well, there was a dog at the beginning, and at the end, some old man was crying. We don't have a clue. Yeah. So guard your heart. Everybody say guard your heart guard and your mind. Your and then the fourth is seek accountability. This is important. That We found this in our, in our walk with God when we were dating and courting is that you find accountability partners in your Christian community. These are the people that will support you to live out your sexual purity. Um, because the Bible teaches us that there's uh, wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And if you have people in your life who will ask you the hard questions and they'll ask you, have you crossed a boundary? How's your soul? Are you yielding to temptation? Did you slip? Come on. Those accountability people will hold you to the, keep your feet to the fire. And you know, you almost dread them coming because here they come. They're going to ask me. But you need them. We need accountability people in our life. And so when you're single and let's say you are pursuing a relationship or you're, you're dating or you're, you know, someone this, that, you have to have accountability people in your life who allow you to confess things to you, but they will also hold you accountable. And the scripture, of course, is in James 5, 16. It says, confess your sins one another. Now, King James says, confess your faults with one another. Uh, and then pray for one another that you may be healed. And so it's important to have the right accountability people. You don't want to tell too many people your business. Telephone, telegraph, tell Tabitha. There are certain people you shouldn't tell your business to because they will just repeat it. And so be very careful there, but you need accountability. And it's very important to have. The next one is pray for strength and wisdom. This is where we ask God, give me wisdom to know how to handle this and to walk with this. I, I, I need the wisdom of the Lord to give me strength. When the enemy puts a bad thought in your mind, the only way to overcome that bad thought is to push it out with a better thought through the Word of God. 
And that's why we must fall in love with the scriptures and let the word of God sustain us and keep us and be the light that directs us. So in prayer, that's when I'm asking God. I'm asking, I'm summoning God. Lord, produce in me a desire for you. Let it come. Give me wisdom. Give me strength because I don't want to be entrapped in a sinful situation. So this would move to the next one. And we're going to open up for Q&A in just a little bit here. Focus on spiritual growth. Prioritize your relationship with God and seek his guidance in all areas of your life, including relationships and sexuality. When you renew your mind by setting your mind on things above, you are allowing the Holy Spirit to take ownership and precedence in your life, and he owns your body. And now you're moving into a place of of uh, spiritual growth by replacing anything that's not of God with the word of the Lord. We're going to give you number seven, and we're, we're going to dig into this. This is where you learn to practice self-control. This is a biggie right here because self-control means you are developing self-discipline. Self-control, you're relying on the Holy Spirit to help you to resist the temptation. Now, there are nine fruit of the Spirit that Paul lists married to the nine gifts of the Spirit that Paul lists in Corinthians. And one of those fruit is self-control. Yes. Self-control. How do I have self-control as a single, sexually? How do I avoid temptation? Is it by turning the internet off? Is it by going to gospel music concerts? <laughs> is it to go to church every night? It might be. But it's practicing the disciplines in your life that say, if I enter into a relationship with someone and we're going to church together, which the Bible teaches us not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever anyway. So, but what if you go to a church and there's no good pickings? There's nobody. <laughs> Look for the anointing sisters. <laughs> But here's the thing. When you are in relationship, you have to start visualizing the person you are in relationship as a brother or a sister in Christ. And you say, I am going to view them through the eyes of eternity. Not temporal, but eternal. I'm not going to view them through the eyes of temporary satisfaction, I'm going to view people of the opposite sex in relationship to eternity. I'm not going to fantasize about a person. I'm going to think of them. If I do think of them, I should be thinking of what eternal torment and hell they would have if they follow my bad example and allow me to have my way with them. Is that too tough? So I have to view people through the lens that they're my brother or sister and I don't want to offend them and I don't want to cause them to be offended. And so we have to guard our flesh and walk in self-discipline and self-control and view everybody through the eternal perspective of God. I want to quickly just add something in here where we're talking about self-discipline and self-control. Well, first of all, the key word is it's self-discipline. We're not trying to control everyone else, but first of all, it starts with us, self-discipline, self-control, and we can't do it on our own. It can only come through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes, sometimes deliverance, if we're in some type of cycle, which there are sexual cycles, okay, of things that people are bound by, Sometimes God and his blood is enough. Believe me, in an instant, he can lift that off of you and it can be gone. But I just want to share this. I felt in my spirit and I haven't shared it in any other session except right now. But there may be times that it's a progressive walk that we're gonna have to start walking through, making those good choices, but then walking them through. So if we've got some habits in our life that are unhealthy or that are leading us down a wrong track, when Pastor just said, we combat that with, with another thought, with the word of God. I just Googled this because I wanted to see how many days does it take to form a habit? And it used to say, it said that it used to be 21 days rules, but that's a myth. In a new study published, researchers have found 
listen, I just felt this, that it takes an average of 66 days for a new, be, new behavior to become a habit. Well, do you know how many books are in the Bible? Ooh. Wow. So, walk it out with the word. Mic drop. <laughs> It's important to practice self-control. You are in control of your body. Yes. You are in control of your vessel. And you're to treat the vessel that God gave you with honor and respect so that your vessel is glorifying God. And we're, we have a hard time with self-control, whether it's food. You know, you can eat a whole box of Little Debbie's by yourself. Oh, I love Debbie. And that's wrong. You know, <laughs> it's not healthy. It's not healthy to do that. Right? Yes. We have to practice self-control, whether we're a man or a woman. We have to say, I'm not going to do that. I have a, a parameters and boundaries in my life, and I want to honor God. I want my life and my body to even glorify God. Mm. And I don't want to lead anyone else down a path of destruction or lead anyone else in a wrong way. I don't want them to be in eternal torment because of things that I cause them to stumble at. You know, there is a passage that talks about if you cause your brother to offend. Mm. And then there's a part that said that if you cause one of these little children to be a to stumble. It's better a millstone be hung around your neck and you be cast into the bottom of the sea. So you have to think about, is what I'm doing going to cause someone else to stumble? So it's hard to fantasize about someone that you see as your brother and sister in Christ. If you look at them through eternal lens of God and say, that's my brother and my sister in Christ. We, um, we courted uh, we dated for like five years. Did I tell this? That we, our school, our, uh, our dates were at church. Her, her dad pastored and my dad pastored and they would preach for one another. So anytime we were preached for one another, we called that a date <laughs> in church. And then... And let me tell you, the anointing was attractive. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. Indeed, He's attractive. I'm indeed. teasing. <laughs> but I remember one time there was a revival, and I asked Beverly if she would go out with me. Well, we, we couldn't go nowhere but church, so we went to the revival. That was our date. You understand what I'm saying? But we had also accountability. We had our parents in our life. We had different ones in our life that helped us to, to make right choices and guarded us and protected us. And here's, here's one thing I would say even about um, our, our daughter, Caitlin, and her husband, Ethan. When Ethan came to us as our student pastor, he wasn't a spring chicken. What that means is he wasn't like he was 15, 16, 18. He was already in his, in his uh, late 20s. And so he had life experience behind him. Caitlin was the sa is the same age. And she's in college and she's got life experience. It didn't like they were dating in high school, were high school sweethearts and had that season of temptation in their life. Now they're involved in ministry. They're serving the Lord with gladness. They have ministry titles. They are going to school. They have life in front of them. So we had to set boundaries for them. Because we wanted to protect their future and protect their ministry so that their good would not be evil spoken of. So we'd say things like this. You can't be alone together at the parsonage. You can't go this alone. You can't do this alone. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And it was a lot of don'ts, but it was also some do's. But we, we had to help protect their ministry and their future. And I think... As a single person, yeah. that they, you, every one of us, no matter if single or married, but if you're single, think about your future. What do you want that to look like? What do you want to be known for? Yeah. Easy. Do, what do, you, do you want to be known as someone that's, uh, uh, you know, just has no morality, no values? Or do you want to be known as someone that has a high standard? And uh, I'm not saying that you're so picky that you, even God couldn't bring you somebody because you overanalyze them. <laughs> but because we have a standard, but there ought to be certain principles that we will not yield on. We should all have some non-negotiables. Yes. Those are the values that we have. So I think it's important that you protect your future. 
And it's important that you protect yourself from sexual immorality and, and flee from it and, and run from it. The Bible says run from temptation. So find a door, and if there's no door, make a door. <laughs> Kick a door in and get out of there because you know what you can handle. You know what you can handle. If you sit long enough and dwell on something and meditate it, and after you commit sin, it'll be about 30 minutes later, you'll be saying, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, da, 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 da. But God don't want that to be a cycle in our life. He wants us to flee from those lusts and run after him and glorify God with our body. And so we want to open up for some Q&A maybe and talk a little bit about maybe something that we talked about or maybe something that you have a question about. Is there anybody, feel free to ask. We've got about 10 minutes to share. God bless you. Well, what, if those of you that didn't hear what Karen said, she said, we don't want to see men tight and wearing tight clothes in the gym, and we don't want to see them sagging their, their jeans and their pants. We don't want to see that mess either, which is true. And a lot of emphasis, it doesn't seem like a lot of the things we talk about are towards the ladies. Uh, you know, ladies are more... Um, I, well, I guess we couldn't say that today now because with social media, men have come out, you know, and they're just really uh, letting everybody see everything. But um, I, for the life of me, I struggle with this. Why, when people know it's their birthday time and they decide to have a photo shoot? Everybody has to straddle a chair. They go straddle a chair. And a tight slit. I don't, and if, please, I have not looked at who's wearing what today. No, we haven't. This but is just I'm in general. Saying, I'm just going to make a general statement. Leggings are not slacks. You're going to get mad at me. I understand. But what I'm saying is we ought not see everything. And why is it that we have this need? If we have sexual responsibility, then we also have to control ourselves. I think it, it goes back to, I don't want to interrupt you here, but... This is for men and for women. We just need to, which I don't think we even got to this, but remember our worth. When we know our worth, then we're going to present ourselves differently. Even in our home, if we know something is of great worth, it's even set to a different standard. It's maybe placed at a higher level. It's put somewhere different because we know that that is of great value. And I speak that over all, each of you, not just the women, but the men. You are of great worth. And you should remember that. We don't have to find our worth. Social media has made it, oh, I mean, so difficult that even people who say, well, I don't pay any attention to that, it's hard not to. Like, well, my worth is by how many likes I got. Or they liked it, but they didn't love it. Or this or that. Our worth is not in any of that. In fact, if, we, if you need to do a total social media detox, I encourage do it. Anything that can help us get our focus off of what the world says is is the norm and focused back on what God says is the norm. Well, and ultimately, it's, am I glorifying God? Right. Is my body glorifying God? So I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility sexually. Every one of us do. And we are to keep our vessel unto the Lord and not in, get ourselves in fornication. Yeah. And if we're married, not to give ourselves into adultery. And it goes, it's everywhere. And it's even in the church. Come on. So let me say this to you about be careful who you let whisper in your ear. Be careful um, who is uh, trying to get your attention. Be careful. Guard yourself. Protect yourself. You are too valuable to let any old body just uh, take you on a, a road that God never intended for your life. Remember your worth in Christ. And even something that may start out and it may not have had any bad intentions when it started, but the enemy can get a foothold. This is something to remember as well. If you are a single person, you should not be having conversations with a married person of the opposite sex. It may even start out innocently, even in the church, a brother in the church sliding into your DMs to say, I appreciated that song. Uh-uh. And you need to be bold enough to say, 
tell your wife I appreciate that. <laughs> It'll cut it off quickly. And that's one of the things that quickly. Beverly and I do. If we're sending a text, I try not to uh, send a direct text to a single lady or a married lady. I put Pastor Bev in the text. And it's so not that, that we don't trust one another. That's no, not it. Some but we don't like, want to give any place give any to place. the devil. Yes. And, and I, don't, I don't counsel ladies by myself. It's because I'm not going to let the devil get a foothold. Um, it's, do I trust myself? Do I trust them? I, you know, we're all subject to temptation. I do trust myself, praise the Lord, and I mean, but I don't glory in that because Paul said, there go I, except by the grace of God. So you've got to guard yourself but at all times. And uh, I, I hardly travel alone because of that, because uh, if Pastor Bev can't go with me, then I try to have an armor bearer with me so that my, my testimony is, is sure. Um, but, you know, those are things that you learn as you go, and you just have to guard your testimony at all times. You, you, there should be no man slipping a, a, a note to a woman in the church hallway saying, this is my number, call me if you want to talk. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. Uh, I'm, and especially married men doing that kind of stuff. You better call the devil out and say, not today, devil. Brother Nick. So they've come to you and said that they're trying to live free from that now, but they have a history of that, and they're struggling, and they're struggling with it. Yeah. Well, obviously, is to to bring them into a loving relationship with Christ, where he, where they forg- they ask God to forgive them of their sins, and they experience the repentance, and they experience the change that comes through that relationship by faith. I think that's the first start. The first start is to love them. If you've got somebody coming to you and they're sharing the, the good, the bad, and the not so good, uh, just you know, be a friend to them and listen to them and, 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 and say, I'm praying for you and, and uh, offer a scripture where you can. And if you feel a door's open there, um, because some people come to you, but then they say, oh, you're going to go churchy on me. But, you know, just, but live that in front of them. Live that in front of them. And ultimately, God will give you a place and a space where you'll be able to give them a foundation of truth. And a principle will come out of your lips and that'll take hold in their heart. And the only thing you can do is live in front of them and lead them towards it. And then allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you to give counsel, to give counsel. But the best thing is just to be a friend to them. Be a friend to them. There's a reason they're coming to you. There's a reason they're being drawn to you to ask you those questions. So be quick to listen and slow to speak. And ultimately, it's going to take, I mean, we can give them, we can pray for them, we can give the word. And I know that the word, the word does work. Ultimately, though, it's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit in their own life that's going to be able to help them overcome that. So Amen. that's why encouraging them in their walk with Christ. Amen. Well, we've reached our end. We've got two minutes and the lunch crowd's going to come in here like it's Friday pizza day at school. <laughs> So we're going to let you eat first, amen? And um, I don't know who's in charge, because um, I'm not, but uh, there, somebody's in charge, so we better wait till they give us instruction. Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for our time together. Thank you, Lord, for revelation and truth and also binding us together by the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.